In 2012, two years before her death at the age of 68, I visited Sue at home and she told me about how and where she listened to Test Match Special. I always listen to it um, in the car and in the bathroom. <laughs> oh, okay. Because that's where the radios are pre-tuned. Right. Yeah. A, a lengthy state, what, in the, in the bath? Yeah. I, I can picture yeah. it. I'll, 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 next time we're commentating, wait. It's not, <laughs> it's not, it's not a pretty sight, so <laughs> no. don't picture it. No. But, and, but what, what are your, what, what do you like about cricket then? And, and cricket on the radio? Oh, I love the commentary, of course. I mean, I do, I'm not flattering you. I just love the, you know, the rambling nature of the conversation and how it, it changes with everybody that sort of comes in and out, or, you know, comes in and out on the mic and, and the good humour of it. You know, and I like I like that that kind of decent Englishness. You know, because you, you don't get it much, and if you do, you you know, people accuse you of being semi-fascist. That's, <laughs> so that's true. They do. You were you're a very Leicester person, aren't you? You were mm. born just down the road from Grace Road. Yeah, I was. The yeah. the the estate. Uh, Saffron Lane, in which you uh, yeah, worked worked and talked much about in your books, of course, is just up the road from, from Grace Road. It is, yeah. Did you, did you get yeah. down there much at all to see any of the, of the cricket? Um, I prefer it on the radio, I, because I can't see now, I'm registered blind. I mean, yeah. I can see certain things, but I can't see the cricket, unfortunately. It was cricket that made me realise, actually, that um, I'd got a serious sight problem because my husband was driving me to the station um, as he did, you know, a lot of mornings in a week because I, I, I worked a lot in London and um, and it was about 8 o'clock in the morning and I looked over Victoria Park and I could see these cricketers mm. and I said, that's so early to be playing cricket in the morning and they're all in whites and I said, what's going on? And he said, nobody is playing cricket, Sue. There's nobody on Victoria Park. And I said, of course there, there is, I can see them. And what it was, we were going by and it was the war memorial, right. the white marble um, seen through trees as you traveled along. Oh, yeah. it, it, the brain obviously sent a message to me, white, and, and it was cricket. You know, the brain is, um, when you lose your sight, the brain panics a bit and keeps sending messages, messages that it thinks fit the image that you're you know, trying to get, such as potato peelings looking like rubber gloves or vice versa. So you throw the rub rubber gloves in the bin thinking they're potato <laughs> peelings. Really? It will supply an image, yeah, and then it gets used to the fact that you can't see properly. That must have been but a... That was the first, yeah. first thing that was made me realize yeah. but it's sad in a way that cricket mm. should, have, should have done that too, i know i know but i do love it um i like the formality of it and i like the fact that there were lots of rules you know i'm i'm a person that doesn't like rules well, I, I was gonna say of, you strike me as one of those least formal people uh, yeah, I, I, I do kick against rules when it concerns me but i i actually like the formality of cricket and the fact that there are umpires and now the third umpire is a good thing, I think. Do you like all that, do you? All yeah, technology. I like the whites, and I loathe 2020. <laughs> I hate the clothes they wear. Do you? They look like 1930s baseball players. That is such a recurring theme on this little slot, you know, view from the boundary. The guests that we have, maybe, maybe you're all a certain age, Sue. Well, I couple. am a certain age. I'm 63. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, yeah. But it is. People, people we have on here are determined test cricket lovers and, and, they, yeah. and they're, they're always volunteer. Oh, I don't like yeah. 2020 before I've even had a chance to ask them yeah. often. And yeah. Here you are. You're obviously very attached to kids, though, I'd, I'd assume, aren't you? Or, or is that all made up with Adrian Wells stuff? Do, do, What's that? Well, so, your, your, your attachment to kids and the kid, oh, yeah, kids yeah. love 2020. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've got... Ten grandchildren as well. Right. Um, they're not keen on 2020 either. Because they, they, well, they think they look ridiculous. They don't wear Englishmen don't don't look right in American clothes. They're cut differently. <laughs> right. <laughs> they're they're styled to make them look like boys rather than men. And I think in the cricket whites they look like men. They look like proper men. Right. Uh, you know, a ma masculine man. I'm talking about. <laughs> this is going to get me into trouble. <laughs> I know it is. No, you're right. But no, I like I like a bit of difference in the clothing, you know, in the sexes. Yes, and well, I agree. Man, the cricket whites and the green background, 
is, is, is the way to watch cricket, in my view. I think so, too, yeah. yeah. And there has to be... Well, has to be traffic for Henry. It does. There has to be, you know, public transport. Geoffrey Boycott, to offer, offer that as a name? Geoffrey? Mm. Oh, God. When Geoffrey was on... When Geoffrey was batting... Mm. I used to live in the high fields, and, yes. and when Geoffrey was batting, we would all watch the cricket, and when he came in, after about five minutes, I'd get up and I'd peel the potatoes, <laughs> cook dinner, cook pudding, eat it, wash up, come back, knowing it'd still be, it'd still there. be there. Oh, yes. And I, we wouldn't miss anything. <laughs> I mean, there might have been a you know, tiny difference in how he held that bat, but very little. He would have caught a, scored maybe another 10 <laughs> runs by then, wouldn't he, surely? I mean, he'd have taken an advance he might, from 10 he to 20. May, yeah, he may have done that or gone into the teens, but... Yeah. Yeah, but now I, I you know, I quite understand um, his psychology now. You know, I, I do. But <laughs> I'm fascinated by, by this business of someone who is is a Republican, doesn't seem to like the, 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 the rules of, of, of you know, I don't know, the strict rules and regulations and so on. I'm fascinated, therefore, why cricket should be attractive. Is, mm. is, is, is that, it seems like a very old paradox, doesn't it? It is, yeah. I agree, I agree it is, but it has to be fair. That's the, that's the main thing, the main quality that cricket has. It has to be fair. And that's why I was so upset at you know the the finding. You know when people have found the You're brown the leather jacket, the brown leather jacket. Oh yes, thing. match fixing and corruption. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's so distress. It really is distressing. Mm. Um, I hate corruption because it corrodes everything, every area of life. Yeah, you just um, feel that cricket shouldn't be that sort of sport that should be tainted by that. Oh you? no, 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 no sport, no mm. sport. Now, being a Leicester girl, Sue. I mean, mm. David Gower must have been mm. one of your. Mm. Pin-ups, was he? I mean, a bit younger than No, you, I was course. way too old for him, even when he was, uh, yeah, when he was young. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I've, I've seen plenty of middle-aged women down there at Grace Road. Oh, I agree, yeah. Waving from the yeah. stands at him. Yeah, I'm sure, yeah. I'm, I mean, I, I, I admire David Gower for one thing, and that was, um, was it being in a plane going over? Oh, yes, he did. Yeah. He did that. Didn't that was he? breaking rules. And I, that was breaking rules. Yes, and, uh, that was real li I was, liberation. I was torn both ways then. You know, I, I kind of admired the cheek, and because uh, it was a big gesture. It was. <laughs> it wasn't just a bit of. Fortunately, it wasn't as quite as big as it might have been because he wanted to go up with some water bombs, and <gasps> drop them on the pitch. <gasps> and the pilot of this <gasps> Tiger Moth, it was in, it was in oh, um, Queensland. Yeah, yeah, it's in Queensland. Yeah. Um, Bruce McGarvey. I can still remember his name of that pilot. You know, it's etched on my. <laughs> I was I was reporting on this. <laughs> it's etched on my mind. 1991, it was, and. Um, David wanted to take some water bombs up, mm. and Bruce said, no, mate, you're not going to go and do that, because he's going to drop them on the players. Tell me when you first realised it was David Gower. <laughs> oh, that's a very good question, and quite a long story. I don't but, mind, I'm Well, that's OK, because I was, I was tipped off by the photographer. Oh. And so I had the story exclusively to myself. I worked for a tabloid paper at the time, so I had it all to myself. But one of the highlights, well, there are two highlights of this particular story. The first was that David had been subbed the money for the flight by the the tour manager, who was most unimpressed by the whole thing, <laughs> if you remember. Uh, and the second was at the end of play, when word got out that it was David Gower, he was, and, and the manager went looking for him to go and, uh, and have it out with him, he was actually back at the airfield having more photographs taken by all the photographers. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a chaotic, a chaotic scene. But isn't it funny you should remember that rather than any of his lovely hundreds or... Yeah, 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 it is, yeah. Well, that's the power of the uh, tabloid press, I suppose. I do remember. I mean, I do remember he had a lovely, languid style. And I understand he's a kind of languid person. Yes, he is. Definitely. Yeah. You can imagine him lolling around, you know, in the 20s. I think that's probably his time, really. Lord Gower, they I call him. Yeah, Lord Gower. Yeah. 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 Well, he was a Leicester man. I mean, so here we are in your lovely kitchen, a lovely house. And what a successful career you've had. I mean, do you still look back at those 80s... <laughs> Adrian mm. Mole and, and, and all mm. of that. I mean, was, mm. was that really sort of the, 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 high, the high point for, for you? Um, well, I was a secret writer. I left school at actually 14 because yes. in those days, if your birthday fell in Easter, you could leave. We were called Easter Leavers. And uh, it was kind of shameful, but anyway, there were lots of jobs in those days. You could just walk into any job. And if you didn't like it in the morning, you could go to another one in the afternoon. I carried on writing, so I enjoyed writing compositions at school. Right. Things like 
a day in the life of a penny. You know? <laughs> so, you, so you were writing at school. It wasn't that you left for, at 14 because you just weren't in, interested in, in anything. No, I was writing and I was getting a lot of praise for my writing. And I entered the school essay competition. Mm. It had to be fictional. There was me and another girl called Sue Johnston. We didn't know who would win, but one of us would win. We'd been shortlisted. I was convinced I'd win. I'd been working on this thing for a long while. And I didn't win, and, and Sue Johnston won, because the, the English mistress said that I had used a cliché. Oh, no. And uh, it was clouds like cotton wool. Oh. I'd never, to my knowledge, ever used it or heard it or read oh. it in a book. Is it frowned upon? Oh, God, yes. I use it all the time. Oh, oh, oh no. Um, change. I'll change the script. It's re it really taught me a lesson. Oh. And uh, I, if, I mean, some, a lot of English is, you, there's no way around it. You, 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 you have to use that cliche. But as far as possible, I, I, I steer away from them. Right. Yeah. What about sort of similes and... Um, what, they're, they're like mm. Henry Blofeld, or you know, they're, they're people like you know, hitting a ball like, like like a like a kicking horse, or we're always saying oh, that no, the, the ball good. streaks over the outfield, or like a, like mm. a, like a, like a rocket. No, I like no, that's that's all. Like that's okay because that does summon up the speed. Of, right. Uh, yeah, I, I don't mind those at all, but it's when, when you come to write fiction and write or write poetry, or I think I think in speech it's it's going to be, you know. It's going to be allowed. But I, I do hate over the moon. People have started saying, obviously, all the while now. Yes. You know, I'm, I almost said, obviously. <laughs> it's, it's just amazing. Um, from, from high court judges to politicians to the people on the Jeremy Cow show, they're all using obviously. And as we go forward, as we go forward, as if we have any choice, <laughs> we can only go forward. Yes. <laughs> Interesting how you pick these things up. Well, I've got, a, a, you know, I have to listen really carefully because I have to try and replicate the way that people use their language. We all speak the same language, but we use it very differently. Do you find it frustrating that you can't see the cricket? I mean, you listen to it. Do, uh, it, it does it help that, that you have seen cricket? Yeah. But when you could see, yeah. yeah. And so, so I mean, I, what yeah, always amazes I, me I, are blind, I, yeah. blind people from birth who've never seen it. I know. Never yeah. seen cricket. I know. And yet they love it. Like and they, Peter and they love White. Listening. Peter White, yes. who's a friend of mine, yeah. I mean, how do they, how do I, they imagine it? I how can't they see it? imagine. I, I can't imagine that. Yeah. But I used to play cricket when I was a child. Oh. Yeah, in, in our neighbourhood. Right. All the prefab children whose fathers are all very clever, mothers too. Um, we used to go on to um, what we called the park, but really it was just a field of grass, <laughs> wild grass, um, because it was all farmland. After the grass had been cut or scythed down, yes. um, we, we would first have a grass fight, which I was always really fearful of, <laughs> because they'd bend these tall stalks of grass and use them as a kind of bat on. Oh, right, like a whip. Like a whip, yeah. yeah. So I was always cringing away. Um, there were a lot of boys in the area, not that many girls. Um, and then when we cleared the grass away, we'd play cricket. And um, I was on the outfield because I was a really good thrower right. and catcher. But um, in fact, the catcher in the rye, oh, yeah. <laughs> because that's where the title comes from. They're yeah, playing really. baseball, right. and when you get to the rye grass, that's the boundary. Boundary edge. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. You were the catcher in the grass. I was, yeah, I was, yeah, in the long grass. I got hit on the head twice with a cricket ball. Right. I've never forgotten it. No. You know, it's one of the big things of my life, <laughs> both times. Yeah, batting or, or dropping catches? Bat no, 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 no. Being hit by the bat batsman and the, hitting the ball so hard, oh. um, trying to get a boundary trying to get a six and yes. I was there and I think it's instinctive if the ball's coming towards you you kind of put your turn your head and put your hand yes. <laughs> well, I did anyway and the ball somehow came through the middle of my hands and hit my yes. temple Who really saw? really hard yeah and you do see stars yes that's also quite a common thing in these interviews actually the number of people who have played cricket mm. who did all get hurt at some stage of playing it. often <laughs> often batting or something that's and you right. know teeth knocked out or hit on the head or <laughs> broken right. fingers it's a dangerous why game. do we love this sport 
because we think it will never happen to us. I mean, the sport's bigger than our yes. insignificant little worries about safety, especially when you grew up like I grew up in the late 40s and 50s. You know, I mean, this is a big cliche about how you could leave your house in the morning with a bottle of water and you know, jam sandwiches or whatever and, and just not come back until after dark. You just yes. go. And if you got hungry, you ate, you know, you're like a feral child, you ate berries. And, and if you were desperate, that lovely succulent grass that soft, that has a soft leaf and you pull the outer. Mm. Uh, skin off the grass and inside it's beautiful sweet in a what would you call it this is like a fleshy green delicious i've forgotten all about that yeah we had, we used to eat all sorts of stuff and of course there were lots in the summer and early autumn there's lots of fruit growing on you know overhanging from people's gardens and and where we played was in lady ralston's estate they moved to somewhere in Norfolk, to another manor house. Um, and we played in the deserted mansion, hmm. you know, in the ballroom and everywhere. And they had all these ornamental ponds and, and trees. And, and we had, I can't tell you how wonderful it was, the yeah. playing. Come on then, all this secret writing, Sue. I mean, mm. how, how, how did you, did we really tucked away quietly, not mm. telling anybody what you were doing yeah. and writing the secret diary of Adrian mm. Mel? I wrote um, the first three months of HMO when my oldest son, Sean, <laughs> said, and it's the only thing taken from life in HMO, he said, why can't we go to safari parks like other families do? Right. And it was the first kind of mini criticism of the family. And I just remembered feeling like that myself. And every child has to feel that at some point. Because if we didn't, we'd be clones of our parents. You know, we have to be ourselves. And so I instantly felt this thing. <laughs> this makes me sound like a complete mad woman. I, I just felt this family descended. I heard Adrian's voice. I heard, because Adrian was such an uptight, keep your bedroom tidy boy. Yes. You know, um, he had to have kind of feckless parents. You know, who like a bit of a drink, but not as much as he thinks. He thinks they're both alcoholics, yes. just because his mother drinks at Christmas. Um, I, I could be in a children's home this time next year, he writes. <laughs> and, um, and then because his parents were as they were, his grandmother had to be a traditional grandmother, yes, Yorkshire so pudding grandmother, he calls yes. her, gravy grandmother. Um, and so that's the immediate family, but then you know, there's, all, there's his friends, his headmaster, um, Rick Lemon, the youth leader. There are all these people that I kind of half fall in love with. These, the part, they, they're just, you know, they're there for a few pages and they disappear forever. Why, um, why were you writing it secretly, though, to start with? Why, why did you hide yourself well, away? You know, I was reading from the age of eight and a half. I've learned to read with the... I was a late reader. My, my mum taught me to read when I was away from school with mumps. <laughs> and, and she came, went to a rummage sale and she brought home a big stack of William Brown books. You know, William. Oh, William yes, books. Yes. Oh, I was away. I, you know, I asked her to read what was underneath those lovely scratchy illustrations. And, um, and she read that. And I don't know what happened, but, it, you know, I was away for three weeks. So in that three weeks... I learned to read. <laughs> because I'd learned to read with William books, I'd got quite a kind of sophisticated taste in books. Yeah. You know? I missed out that whole kind of... Well, I was going to say Enid Blyton. And and John and, I mean, yeah, it, it, things like... Yeah. I never... No, I didn't read Enid Blyton. I just missed it out. And, and I, I soon got through the books and, and I went um, to the school library looking for more. And I found a few. And then... I, and I kept asking for them, and the, the teachers would say, well, they'll be in the library. And I hadn't realised I could join the library. So you know, this was amazing. You could have four books a week, I think. And uh, I, I was soon reading, in the school holidays, three books a day. Really? Yeah, and I was um, accused of 
wasting the librarian's time. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody could have read those books, but I became a speed reader right from yeah. the start. Are we taking in the words and the phrases? And you're the, taking the pictures in the words, and, yeah. but your brain is not reading the um, descriptions. You know, uh, the description has to be where you are, if you're outside the weather, because that's quite important, uh, where you are, and uh, is it summer, spring? I don't want to read three pages of what, it's, what, what an autumn leaf looks like. You know, yes. I don't want that. I want to get on with the story. Gritty, gritty time. I want to quickly get on with what the characters are saying to each other, especially if it's comedy. You don't want to mess about with a lot of, um, o you know, over-description. Yeah. I mean, that is... You know, I can do that fine writing if I want to, but I, I don't want to. You know, I, as George Orwell said, uh, good writing is to do with putting the right word in a pleasant order. <laughs> and, pl a good, and a plain word at that. Yeah. If there's a plain word that everybody understands and, and, and fits the rhythm of the sentence, then use it. Yeah. What was the process, Sue, when you, I mean, what were you, what were you writing into, or exercise book or something? Where, when, when did you actually, actually bring this book out and say, actually, I've been working on this for, yeah. for three months I, and well, I think it's rather well, good? When the kids were in bed, uh, you know, I had uh, three, three children under five at one time. When they were in bed, and I can only ever write when my children are in bed and unconscious. Hmm. I used to write all sorts of stuff, poetry, <laughs> and short stories. You know, starting novels and, you know, messing about with words. And, and I bought those cheap reporters' notebooks. And I eventually, after 20 years, I filled a fridge freezer box with these scraps and pieces. But mole was just thrown into the box under the stairs. Really? Yeah. And, and, and that, the, the Saffrodane estate, which um, mm. you know, anyone in Leicester will know, um, I mean, was, it, was it based on there? And, and I mean, I should think life on there was pretty challenging. I no, it was, no, Mole wasn't uh, based on that. The Mole family were the first family in their long line of uh, relations to buy their own house. So they got so out they, of there. Yeah, yeah, so they, yeah, his mother lives in a council house and Bert Baxter lives in a council house. I mean, uh, yes. pensioners bungalow on the SAF, but the moles just getting a foot on that bottom ladder. They wouldn't be able to do it now, but no. then it was just starting to happen. And the television series, uh, Sue, I mean, were you involved in that? I mean, I, I, you often read of, or hear of frustrations for the author, and, mm. uh, or, 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 or yeah. you know, the, the book becomes a film mm. and they're not involved. Were you, were you involved in, in that? Yeah, I was, yeah. I, I wrote the first script. Yeah, I wrote, I wrote the script for the first six episodes. I worked with a director who's Hungarian, Peter Sazdi. Um, most of his work had been with Hammer Horror. Right. <laughs> Excuse me. With a change of direction then. Mm. He directed that film where the baby climbs out of its cot and somehow manages, a baby of about six months, somehow manages to open the front door and then crawl down the street. Right. <laughs> crawl into somebody else's house crawl upstairs and uh, kill the neighbour who's asleep in bed. Strangely, Jonathan, nobody suspected the baby. Oh, really? <laughs> no, that's, I, I suppose, I suppose you wouldn't. <laughs> what a strange man to direct, um, to direct Baby well, Mole. Well, well, I think that's why they all had Birmingham accents and oh, Beryl Reed thought she knew what a Leicester accent was. And I was very, very particular about they had to have Leicester accents. I'd written to that rhythm of Leicester. Yeah. There's a, you know, every, Lestor. every Leicester. I mean, it's <laughs> got a slack, that slack jaw. Yes. You know. We love it though. It's like, where were, where were we last night and who were we with? My dog. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no, they did it in Birmingham and there was outrage. I mean, there were letters to the Mercury um, that, you know, that they didn't they, they sounded Birmingham, which they did. I, I, I do regret that. I, I re really do regret that. Do you regret but, the but, series? The, you know. you regret the TV series? Yeah. Really? Yeah. It was better on the radio. 
It's meant for the radio. Yeah. Adrian Mole's meant for the radio. It it's a, a monologue. A huge success, though. I mean, it was, it was mm. a part of all our lives in, the, mm. in those, in yeah, those it was, days. So. It was huge, yeah. yeah. Mm. Did it surprise you? Oh, God, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when I heard that the publisher was going to print 5,000 copies, I rang him and asked him not to because... <laughs> because I couldn't possibly see. And I didn't want my name on it either. I thought it was spoiled. You know, there it is, Secret Diary of Adrian Mole by Sue Townsend. You know, I mean, S. Townsend would have been OK. You think, but, because, yeah, well, I was going to ask you, I mean, how, how did you get into a 13-year-old boy's head? Uh, well, I worked as well um, for 11 years part-time in the youth club on, on the, on the Es Monster estate, right. Magpie Youth Club. And um, I knew how they talked to each other when no adults were around. Because they didn't regard me as an adult. I was just a piece of furniture. <laughs> I'd been there that long, you know. So I was kind of privileged to listen to them uh, in a way that their parents, they would never talk in front to their parents. They would never... I mean, there might have been the odd boy, but it was very unusual for them. And, and um, yeah, so I knew, I think I knew, know how, how they felt mm. and how, how they spoke. And anyway, it's not that different from teenage girls. I think that's the time when we have more in common with each other. You know, our emotions are huge. Deep black depression, uh, self-pity, and then exhilaration and madness of being, you know, falling in love or, or anything. You know, life is fantastic and exciting and I can't wait to live it properly. And then that kind of gloom again. I was looking through your other titles, of course, and uh, a couple there on the Royal Family. Mm. You bring yeah. the Queen to the SAF, yeah. don't you? Yeah, I Queen do. and I. Yeah, yeah. There's a Republican government and they, they um, the first act, the first law they make is to depose the Royal Family and make them go and live on a council estate. Yeah, they're sent all of the worlds to live on the Saffron Lane, which I call the Flowers Estate. <laughs> and where the Queen is, that used to be called Hellebore Close, but the children have removed the B-O-R-E, and it's now Hell Close. Right. So that's where the Queen lives. How does she get on? Um, well, the neighbours are kind to her. People say things like, well, she can't help being born into it, can she? You know, like, they pity her, if, yeah. if anything. And they help her cook simple things, show her how to cook simple things. They take her to the market at the end of trading to pick up the rotten, or not so rotten fruit and vegetables, just to make the budget go further. Because, you know, the Queen is on a pension, mm. a, a normal pension. State pension. How do people think of when you write sort of um, Republican type books like that. Do you get any sort of hostile reaction to that or what's, what's, what, what do you get? The only letter I, I remember was from a vicar in the south of England who said I should be ashamed of mocking the Queen and um, the institution of the monarchy. I expected a lot more but, but I now realise that I, I could have been a bit uh, more um, sceptical about the royals. In fact I think I I, I did what I always do with my characters. I kind of fall for them. Okay. I can imagine what it's like to be them. Yes. I can especially imagine what it's like to be Prince Charles, who tried everything, you know, to make his parents proud of him. And, um, and I, you know, my heart goes out to him because he looks... He wasn't suited to be born into the royal family. <laughs> he was suited to be born to parents, Hampstead parents, who were into the arts and were very gentle and sent him to a Montessori school. And you're writing now uh, with your failing sight, Sue. I mean, how, how, do you, how do you physically do it? How, how, how do you actually write? You've got a system going somehow. Yeah, I mean, you don't forget how to write on the page. No. But I can't read it back, so Sean, my oldest son, reads it back and types it. And so you write in longhand? I, I can write, yeah, I write in longhand. Right. Yeah. I never did learn to type. I hated <laughs> typing. Hmm. I've never been any good at things I'm not naturally good at. As long as people are kind to me, I kind of drift along. A bit like David Gower. Yes, there you are. Unfortunately. So, yeah. mm. Do you think your writing has changed um, since you've lost your sight? I mean, are you writing more now mm. as, a, as, a, as a blind person mm. see, you know, sees the world, if you like? No, I don't think so, because, you, you know, you have to ask where 
writing comes from anyway. Nobody knows particularly. But all I know is that it's your subconscious. And as soon as you start to think about a subject, all the knowledge you have already from the day one of your birth is there in the back of your brain. It's everything you've seen, everything you've heard, everything you understand, everything you've read is there. Hmm. And it, it's like dredging it out. You know, you kind of dredge it out. And then, of course, you put it on the paper, on, down on paper. I mean, somebody once said, writing is easy. All you do is to stare down at a white piece of paper until your forehead bleeds. <laughs> Some people say forehead. I don't know which is right. <laughs> Either, but I know the feeling. <laughs> it's an awful feeling when it you look at the blank feeling. piece of paper it or blank is. screen. And it you... is difficult. Mm. If you care about it enough, it's going to be difficult. And then you dredge it out, then you put it down, and then you rewrite constantly, constantly rewrite. Editing what you've done, sort of thing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Take out any extraneous words. Don't have a string of adjectives. You, you know, just think a while and choose one pertinent adjective you know just get get rid of all the kind of fuzzy stuff around yeah. it around a sentence i used to teach uh, or try and teach creative writing on a greek island now, i wouldn't do it in a drafty church hall here but it was a fantastic place to write and to think you know at the start of the course i used to give my well, they always called them participants, but a red pen. And that was the editing pen. And then I'd give them ridiculous deadlines, like 10 minutes, to write, write your obituary mm. and put in two lies so that people had to guess what the lies were. And there was a guy who discovered the ozone layer. We all thought that was a lie, but it wasn't. <laughs> there was an old lady who dance with the Bolshoi ballet, we thought that was a lie, it wasn't. You quickly get to know people. With the lies they do tell, you find out what they wished had happened and what could happen still. It's a wonderful exercise. I say that to all creative writing teachers. <laughs> Use it. <laughs>